four, three, two. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us this Sleep Timber. This is sleepapnea.org's sixth annual Sleep Timber campaign. And this year we are focusing on co-occurring conditions. Uh, previously, we had talked about high blood pressure and GERD that occurs in our patient community. And today we are excited to have uh, four guests join us uh, to talk about sleep apnea and uh, brain function, how it affects your uh, daytime functioning and cognitive abilities. And I'm happy to introduce and bring back Dr. Michael Grandner with us today. He is the Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Arizona. We have Aaron Taylor, who is um, a sleep apnea patient and also works with us here at the uh, sleepapnea.org as our grant writer. And then we have Peter and uh, Jeannie Stein. Uh, they joined our organization in 2018 by participating in the uh, patient-focused FDA uh, event that we had. And Peter has uh, helped our organization as an advisor since then. So thank you all for joining us today and for talking about this subject that 80% of our community has reported still having issues with cognitive daytime functioning and feeling good during the day, even though they may be, um, you know, having treating their, their sleep apnea with a CPAP machine or something. So um, thank you all for joining us. And I'd like to kick it off with Aaron and let's get started with some patient stories and have Aaron talk to us a little bit about, you know, what led her to getting diagnosed and, and what that journey was for her. Hi, Justine. Thanks so much for letting me uh, share my story today. Um, I, my name's Erin, and uh, I developed sleep apnea in 2009 when I got pregnant with my first child. And um, we figured out, my husband and I uh, figured out that I had sleep apnea because we noticed I was snoring all the time, which I had never done before in my life. And sometimes I would wake up and I'd feel out of breath. And, um, you know, once I had my child, I realized that I was having all kinds of different um, problems. I was experiencing depression. I was extraordinarily tired. Um, I was just irritable and having trouble with memory and with concentration. And I chalked it all up just to being a new mom and, uh, you know, not getting a whole lot of sleep, being up several times during the night. But um, as my child got older and we had our second child, the symptoms didn't really go away. They um, got worse in a lot of respects. I um, had really bad chronic depression, which I had to get treated. I had um, a lot of illnesses. I was getting sick all the time. Every cold or flu that would go through the office, I would get it. Um, I had a lot of just irritability, feeling overwhelmed and stressed out all the time. And um, it was really hard to cope with because I kept thinking there was something wrong with me. I kept thinking, yeah, you know, I have all these friends and they're, they work full time and they're moms and they don't seem to be struggling the way I am just to, you know, get out of bed and keep it all together. Um, so, and it started affecting my family life as well. And uh, so I really, you know, with my kids, you know, they kept having to remind me of things. Um, so anyway, when I finally got diagnosed in 2017, it was, um, I started using a CPAP almost right away. And I really did notice improvement on a lot of things. I noticed improvement on, um, I wasn't getting so sick. I didn't feel so stressed out and overwhelmed and emotional. Um, and the memory and concentration got better, but it didn't, it didn't really end though. I still feel like I um, am at a significantly less um, capable place in terms of my memory and concentration than I once was. So it's something that I'm still struggling with today. Right. Dr. Grandner, let's bring you into the conversation here and talk a little bit about, 
you know, how sleep and sleep uh, apnea or sleep disruptions, I guess I should say, you know, affect what's happening to you in the day. What is actually going on that, that causes the maybe irritability or emotional uh, 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 troubles and, and concentration? Yeah. What, one way I like to think about this is that you have these three different systems in the brain. You have a, the system that controls your sleep rhythms. You have, you have the system that controls your wake uh, and energy levels. And you have the system that controls circadian rhythms and, and these biological processes. And these are three totally different systems that interact with each other. And when sleep gets disrupted, all three of them can get thrown off. And when they do, because they touch so many different parts of the brain, it's not surprising that you can have lots of, of brain-related uh, outcomes, whether it's uh, in terms of mental health, whether it's in terms of fatigue or ability to focus, uh, whether it's in terms of cognition, uh, which could mean things like a, able, ability to pay attention and stay focused, uh, things like memory, uh, whether it's uh, recalling things without needing reminders. It could also be the ability to hold things in your memory um, more reliably while you're doing them. Uh, it could also mean your ability to make complex decisions and, and weigh pros and cons and think toward the future. A lot of these things can be impaired if you're not sleeping well. And so with sleep apnea patients, often they report any number of these things, whether it's cognitive problems, focus, attention, memory, uh, fogginess, fatigue, then you get the mental health side. You get things like uh, mood issues, whether it's maybe feeling down or depressed and sluggish, um, or even just sort of feeling blah and like losing interest and, and, and energy and losing um, the ability to even just enjoy things that you normally sort of feel like you should be enjoying and that you're not. Um, these are real symptoms. And when you look at it, the overlap is interesting where you see with depression, you have a lot of appetite dysregulation, you have slowness, you have difficulty concentrating that also um, overlap a bit with, with some of these sleep symptoms too. So I guess, you know, the point I'm trying to make is that it's not surprising that there are so many overlaps, that the fact that there are so many um, just goes to show how important all this is and how important getting treated is. Um, but also, you know, maybe there might be some residual symptoms even after people get treated and um, we need to focus and, and address some of those as well. Yeah, before I bring um, Peter and Jeannie into the conversation, I just want to remind our audience that this is a live session today. And so all of us are here and can take your questions live uh, on all the social media platforms that we're streaming to. So if you have something for one of the panelists here, just go ahead and uh, get that in the chat and we'll go ahead and um, try to get that answered. Let's move on to, to Peter and Jeannie, because just to follow up a, a little bit with what Erin said, that, you know, it was um, her cognitive abilities and her emotions and everything that were going on were affecting, you know, her family life. And I like Peter and Jeannie to talk a little bit about their husband and wife. And, you know, the experience, Peter is a patient and obviously Jeannie is his spouse, caregiver, partner in crime, all of those great things. Um, so I'll let let Peter go ahead and talk a little bit about his story. And then, you know, from Jeannie's perspective of, you know, your, your partner living in the house, what sometimes that does to, you know, your family dynamic. Well, okay, I, I guess I'll do a bit of the talking because I tend to be the more talkative one. <laughs> but uh, I think that um, Jeannie will chime in at the end and go, I, I told you so. Uh, um, so about... Uh, um, Four years ago, four years ago now, somewhere around four years ago, three and a half years ago, I had a um, what was best uh, called by the psychologist uh, psychiatric decompensation. So lo and behold, um, um, bipolar disorder runs in my family. It runs fairly deep and broad throughout um, um, generations in my family. And you always think you're going to be uh, immune to it. And um, lo and behold, about three years ago, four years ago, I had a tremendous amount of work on my plate. Um, I won't go into the story behind that, but it kind of was running two full-time jobs at the same time, very intense. Uh, I, I'm a scientist engineer. I run at a high pace. And, um, and I was under a lot of stress. And I uh, would wake up constantly all night long and start thinking. And after a while, I stopped sleeping. I very much uh, couldn't sleep. I'd lie down for a little while 
And then all of a sudden I'd wake back up again and the mind would start racing and going. And I actually went um, manic. You know, without question, I went manic. And the interesting things that followed was, you know, this was in course sort of around, I'll call it uh, an April time frame that I went manic. And, you know, everybody started to react around me trying to figure out what was wrong. I started to react, uh, you know, yield to the fact that something was wrong and started to figure out what was wrong. Uh, doctors, psychologists, and so forth and so on, and testing. And then lo and behold, you're going into the sum summertime. And uh, I was on my way to a stress test because I wanted to see if that had something to do with it. Um, although everybody around me that knew me said it's not anything to do with my heart. And I uh, had a head-on collision. I fell asleep. I rounded the corner. Whenever I drove, I was having so much difficulty staying awake. It was, it was horrible. I would have to stop every 20 minutes to take a nap. And now I'm late for an appointment. And I said, I got to take a nap. I got to take a nap. I said, no, you're going to be late. And the next thing I hear was the bank. And I actually uh, impacted uh, somebody. Luckily, we just clipped mirrors and went through. I went through his rear quarter. But if I had been a foot to the left, I would have killed somebody without question. And that was when one, somebody, one of the doctors said, hey, do you think he has sleep apnea? Maybe we should get him tested. <laughs> and I go get a sleep test. And lo and behold, it's kind of off the charts. Yeah, I'm, I'm constantly waking up and reacting and going forward. I got on a CPAP machine. And um, you know, over the next several months, it all cleared. Uh, the devastation to my life over the whole episode, I, I won't go into that, was incredibly extensive. Um, so I, um, I can't um, say how much uh, you know, sleep apnea should be on the top of people's minds when we have mental health disorders. Now everybody in my family is starting to question the history of bipolar disorder, how much of it really is a history of sleep apnea. And um, maybe, uh, Jean, do you have anything to add to all of that? <laughs> Well, it's it's still not well. People aren't well aware. For thirty years, I've been telling his doctors he has apnea, uh, but I didn't know how severe it was, and the devastating effects that it will eventually have on him. Uh, I don't know how, and I couldn't get him to to get a sleep study. And it wasn't until a friend who was even more forthright, and she pushed and pushed and. Somehow we got you an emergency sleep study. <laughs> yeah, there's enough focus on it at the time. Yep. Yeah. Dr. Grander, I'd like to bring you back in here. And, uh, you know, something I heard from Aaron and, and from the Steins is that, you know, for Aaron, it, it is, you know, it is it's commonly known, you know, um, postpartum depression, you know, it, you know, women are very aware, families are very aware that after the birth of a baby, this might happen, you know, to, to a woman. Um, people are very aware, as in the Stein family, that, you know, mental health issues are, can be, are, are hereditary. So how do you balance that, knowing those things with, you know, your sleep? Um, you know, how, how should a patient, how should an individual, you know, communicate that with their doctor and, and, and factor that part in? So I think there's two things to think about here. First of all is the issue that um, there's a lot of different kinds of mental health diagnoses and, and we're getting better at recognizing them where there's lots of people who, you know, you talk about family history, uh, a lot of these family histories are never documented because the people never went and sought help. I mean, it was just a character flaw or whatever. We're finally getting to the point where we're recognizing that th these are real conditions that are worth recognizing and treating. So. It's important to note that if you look in the diagnostic manual of, how, of all of these different kind of conditions, whether it's insomnia, insomnia disorders, anxiety disorders, depression disorders, bipolar disorders, pretty much every diagnosis in the book has on its list of key features sleep disturbance of some mm -hmm. sort of another. It's there. And we've always known that sleep disturbance was a core part of, of mental illness. Uh, we've learned a lot since then. We now know that sleep disturbance in one way or another is a major risk factor where even if you don't have any mental health conditions, having the sleep disturbance itself is one of the things that's most likely to bring one on if you didn't have one before. Right. Um, the other thing is you're also talking about um, other health conditions where it goes along with, I know you've talked about hypertension and blood pressure, but talking about pregnancy. Pregnancy-related sleep apnea or gestational sleep apnea exists. Uh, we hear about gestational diabetes, and every pregnant woman has to get a glucose tolerance test, but they don't all need to get a sleep study. Um, 
And I think it's important to note that these things are very common. Um, sleep disorders themselves are shockingly common, even people with, especially in people with any kind of mental health issue, but just in the general population, um, where, what is it, like 85% to 90% of the cases still don't get diagnosed. So just imagine all the people who are out there with these same sleep disorders who have no idea and don't do anything about it. So I, I think the fact that, that people have gone in and been able to take care of it, I think is just a testament to the fact that the system is starting to come around and, and people are starting to be educated. If you look at the numbers, the, the rates of sleep apnea in men, yeah, it's, it, it is tied with things like weight and age, but not always. I mean, I see sleep apnea cases all the time in people who are younger, in athletes, um, in people who don't have the same typical risk factors, yet they still have sleep-related breathing issues. So I guess the two things I want to say is, first of all, that, that sleep, sleep issues are a, a core part of mental health itself and, and mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. And sleep problems are so common that they're, not, they're often sort of overlooked, maybe because we're unconscious when it happens. I don't know. Uh, but, but they're worth taking seriously. You know, and I, I think it's important to to point out, and, and we've had patients talk about this in the past, that, you know, there is also just this irritability and mood factor for a lot of uh, of patients. You know, um, as Aaron was describing the life of a, of, a, of a new mom or a new family with a newborn, you know, you're not getting uh, that much sleep anyways. You're, you know, and so you have a ten ten uh, tendency to maybe have a, a, a shorter fuse or something bothers you you know, a little easier than it used to. Um, but sometimes that, you know, it, it, it's such an incremental, you know, tiny little incremental thing that occurs that you don't really notice it. And then all of a sudden that becomes your baseline, you know, and, and so until you're able to, um, you know, experience a good night's sleep, uh, you know, on a CPAP machine or with some other treatment, you don't really know kind of how bad you're feeling. You know what I mean? Like for Erin, she obviously the, she was triggered with, with her pregnancy and so forth, you know, but with Peter, I'm sure it was a little bit more of that incremental thing, you know, as the job's building up. And, you know, so there's a difference there that, you know, you as a, as a patient or your uh, family around you, you know, needs to, to help you realize. Well, well, I'll say that now I notice it. You know, I now, like you said, you you you, uh, you sort of pick up what your new baseline is. And if I'm on, not not on that machine for sort of in the four hour plus, you know, um, a, a night, you know, uh, I I feel it the next day. And certainly, if I go without, I certainly feel it the next day. And um, and so you know, you kind of become more aware of it uh, uh, quite a bit, you know. And there's the hence of the problem, you know, staying on the machine is. Is annoying and difficult, and sometimes you sort of take it off, and then you fall asleep, and then you, you know, you don't put it on because it's annoying, and and so forth. So you know, but um, there's a self awareness that comes along with this happening to you too. Yes, yes. Um, Dr. Grander, we do you want to speak for a few minutes about you know, especially Peter touched on, you know, people having, you know, they're uncomfortable with the machine, they don't want to wear it. That there are some behavioral behavioral options that they can talk to their doctor about to maybe help them. You know, some people feel claustrophobic, et cetera, You know, to use that type of treatment. Yeah, a, a lot of sleep doctors aren't aren't the first to bring some of these up because they might not be expert in them, but I have yet to find a mask issue that has not been at least made to be manageable. You know, I think there's there's a lots of types of different issues, and we actually have decades now of data on how to deal with them. Um, there are options. There are solutions. Sometimes the solution is as simple as trying a different mask. Sometimes the solution is changing pressure, but sometimes the solution is behavioral and psychological. There's There's procedures like systematic desensitization, and, and, and different exposure therapies. And, and there are other ways to help make it so that when the mask is on, it doesn't create sort of this fear response, this reaction response, this claustrophobia response. Um, sometimes that's the response that causes the problem. Sometimes actually it can be other psychological issues too. So wearing the mask might make people feel vulnerable or might make them feel like the remind them of, of something they're trying to avoid thinking about, or it might, um, lead them to feel unattractive, or it might make them feel like all these other things. But these are all these are all thoughts and feelings. And you know, as a psychologist, I deal with thoughts and feelings all the time. 
Um, and, and, and news to everyone on here, if you didn't know this already, feelings aren't facts. Um, and just because you think something doesn't mean that it's true. It could feel true, but usually reality is a little more shades of gray. And, and often what we can do is we can find a way to get your needs met while also doing the thing that helps your body out as well. Because you know you have a need to feel in control. You have a need to feel like you could remove this if you needed to, or that it's not going to hurt you, or that you can think of yourself as, as in whatever way you need to while also doing it. There's a way. There is a way. Almost always. And, and, and I think that's a great point to bring up. Yeah. I'm going to go to see if we have any questions. I see a lot of chatter going on out there. Uh, any questions or comments? Go ahead. And here's from uh, Gregory Blair. Uh, let's read this. The profile of the middle-aged white Caucasian man is dangerous, as so many not fitting that profile have it. Exactly, Gregory. That's, you know, Aaron's story in a nutshell, um, you know, having it while uh, while she was pregnant. Aaron, let's go back to you and um, talk a little bit because you were saying that you're on your treatment now, which is your CPAP machine. And I, you know, are you using it nightly? And, uh, you know, are you sticking with the treatment? And then you were saying that you're still, you know, not feeling the way you used to re remember, even though you are on the, uh, uh, on the, on the uh, CPAP machine. Yeah, it was, um, you know, I started using a CPAP, the first treatment I tried, and it actually really worked for me. Um, I instantly felt some relief with the CPAP machine and, you know, had a little bit of trouble with getting it fitted and getting the right mask, but uh, really kind of uh, felt an immediate relief from the symptoms after I started using the treatment. And, um, but it, so, you know, certain things went away right away. I, I started feeling more well rested. I wasn't as exhausted. I um, stopped getting sick all the time. I was just in a better mood generally. However, I've noticed that the some of the effects, especially memory, um, and to some extent concentration, just being able to synthesize information and analyze information and sort of um, hold complex systems of thought in my head, I still don't feel like I am back to the point that I was before I uh, got sleep apnea. So it's, um, you know, that's something I'm still kind of trying to work on. Um, but it, it definitely, especially with the memory, I feel like I still do have some residual problems. But um, I, I use my CPAP um, all night. I sleep with it on all night, every night. I love it. I use it when I take naps. Uh, so I'm very fortunate that as a therapy, it was very effective for me. Um, but I still do have some of those residual problems with the mental concentration and memory. And Dr. Grander, what, what are some options that people have, you know, like Erin, she's sticking with her treatment, you know, she's using it every night and, you know, she's still having some of this, this, this cognitive daytime issue, maybe not sleepiness, but it's, it's the concentration, it's the brain fog that I saw up a couple of minutes ago, uh, you know, on the screen. Yeah, this is a really important issue that, you know, there's a reality we need to face here that, People with sleep apnea can get it treated. And often, even when it's treated, it's not all of the effects and symptoms aren't 100% removed. And actually, I think it's very often that the 100% of the effects aren't removed. It's actually more rare that, you know, someone wears a CPAP and all of a sudden it's, it's as if they don't have anything. And that really speaks to the fact that there's a lot we still have to learn about this disorder. This is why research is so important, which is why looking at what's, what happens in the brain at this time and what, what are some of the residual effects and what happens during treatment? I mean, there's a lot of research questions still out there that need to get answered. Um, so, so while I don't have the firm answers of what exactly is happening in the brain that causes this, first I wanna say, yeah, you know, this experience is legit. Like this is what people are experiencing to varying degrees. Some people, you know, they're breathing fine, but you wouldn't know it by how they're falling asleep. And for some people, it's just sort of this residual brain fog and fuzziness and, and sometimes it's circadian, where they're able to get up okay, but then they crash a little earlier than they used to, for example. So, so then the next question is, okay, so now what? Like, what do you do about that? Um, there's a few things you can do. 
Um, one thing that I would that I think is a, a terribly underutilized strategy that is an old standby of behavior therapy is scheduling of like, all right, maybe for a few days, mark out how your energy and mood is across the day, like make a little make a little mark. Um, and then you look at your data for a few days and say, huh, okay, this is when I need to schedule stuff. I thought I was more alert in this time, but actually it turns out here's my here's my good time. And so it also means, Maybe I don't do anything important after dinner. Maybe you know, clear some emails or something. But maybe I'm going to crash a little f faster. Um, there's also things you can do. Things like bright light in the morning for a lot of people can help a lot because now you have the circadian component uh, to the treatment where you can you can counteract some of the fatigue. Um, and and you know, getting getting some physical activity in the morning, especially when it's tied with light, that can also maybe do some wonders. Um, and you know, and also maybe seeing that you know maybe at this point we just don't have perfect solutions yet, and the best we can do is say, you know what, at least it's better now than without anything, and 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 you know, yeah. work around some of these limitations. I mean, we all have limitations, not to minimize them. I have lots of limitations, so does everybody, and and it's our job to not not you know whether we like them or not, whether they're convenient or not, whether they're fair or not. You know, let's see what we can do about them rather than just try and crash through them. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I like the uh, idea. We haven't talked about that before uh, uh, with our community about, you know, taking a look at your, you know, your schedule and see how you're feeling during the day. Um, are there any other questions that are out there? Uh, just wondering if there's anything else. Um, and uh, I, I think that's a good suggestion, um, you know, because I, I, I also hear a lot that, you know, sometimes when new patients, when they, when they just get diagnosed, um, you know, there's a group that instantaneously feels better, which, you know, Aaron did have that and Peter did as well. And then sometimes there's a little bit of a plateau and it's kind of like, you know, you, you think that since you got your diagnosis and got your machine, that's it. It's going to be this pressure and this type of mask and this forever. I don't have to change. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to keep an eye on it. You know, I got it. But it's not really like that. Our bodies are constantly changing as we age. And, you know, um, you know, if you are using a machine for a number of years, especially, you know, imagine if you're a patient getting diagnosed in your 40s, then, uh, you know, here's Blair saying, you know, 21 years he's been, on, uh, excuse me, Gregory, that he's been on a, a machine for 21 years. So when he's when he started, his body was different and now, you know, it's 21 years older. So, you know, maybe there's a different mask, higher settings. And it, I think it's really important for, you know, for our community to know that you need to talk to your doctor uh, about those changes that you're feeling, um, even though they might seem a little, um, you know, just, just seem like a little pieces o o over time. Do you have anything to say, Dr. Grander, about, about um, you know, talking with your doctor and keeping aware of those types of changes? Yeah, I think I think that's that's a really important point that you know we're, we're we are all these dynamic sets of systems and they're always changing. The only constant is change, right? And and we're all rolling with that uh, every year, you know, and, and and that's how it goes. And that would actually be my first point if someone's saying like, you know, this isn't quite doing it. Maybe it's we need to add something. Uh, maybe it's we need to tweak something. Um, but also sometimes there are also other things you can do in your life structurally. So one thing I like to do is to create a scaffold around um, a scaffold around the building you don't want to collapse. So so things like you know we have great technology now for like putting reminders on phones and calendars. I live by my calendar. I mean otherwise I'd be late for everything. Um, you know having a set of reminders in there. Having even if it's over home stuff and house stuff. You can program all that stuff in. Um, we have the ability to take some of that burden off, um, and and we don't, and we can leverage some of that. Um, but yeah, definitely talk to your doctor. I mean, I've done some research where we've done some community-based work looking at who talks to their doctor about sleep, and the real main answer is not enough people. And then when we look at the doctor's data, the doctor, when you look at the data that's collected from doctors, they say how many of your patients talk about sleep? Like nobody. And then you also ask the doctors, do you know what to do when they even do bring it up? And usually they say no, um, which, is, which is probably why they don't bring it up. So I, I think this is important to have resources like, like this group 
um, like like this association and, and others that actually can provide those resources. If you if your doctor says, "Hey, look, I get that this is important, uh, but I'm not up to up to speed on this," you know, you can point them to recommendations and guidelines and referrals. So I, I would say, don't be shy about that. You know, it's funny that you, that you talk about going to see the doctor because, you know, we, we talk about uh, our patients being prepared, you know, and it, it's a good idea for no matter who you're seeing, write your questions down, write your things down that you want to talk about because you get in there and, and I'm, I'm guilty of it too. I get in there, the doctor comes in and it's kind of like this, they're like, hey, how are you doing? And, and it feels like it's a greeting, but really it's the opening of what you're going to talk with them about. And usually I catch myself saying, oh, I'm just fine. You know, like I, I didn't start off with, I'm fine, but you know, I have these things written on my list that I, you know, that I want to go over. I catch myself doing that all the time. You know, it's kind of like, it's like you're having a, um, a, a social interaction <laughs> at the beginning versus a, a professional one. I, you know, just catch myself doing that. Um, I don't know if anyone else does that uh, as well. But um, if I could just talk a little, uh, change the subject a little bit, um, you know, Aaron has uh, uh, some children and Peter and Jeannie mm -hmm. have some uh, young uh, grandchildren. I have a, a daughter as well. And, you know, here we are talking about, um, I don't think we said this before, but I do know that um, from working with Erin that um, sleep apnea runs in her family. I can't remember if it's her mom and her, her dad or just one of those or both of them, uh, you know, have been diagnosed. And Peter was talking about, you know, his family history of, of, of looking at that and, 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 and within his own family. Um, you know, what about, you know, factoring in you know, sleep for, for kids? I mean, here we are, you talk about there's nothing constant but change. You know, that's the one thing that we have. I mean, probably, you know, my daughter's here online school, maybe some with, you know, Aaron and, you know, uh, Peter and Jeannie's uh, uh, grandkids are a little bit younger. I don't know if they could handle online school <laughs> at three or four years old. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, let's talk a little bit about what we need to look at in our kids and our grandkids when we're dealing with these own things ourselves. You want to say anything about that, Dr. Grandner? Or yeah, yeah, no, sorry, I didn't know if it was you know. Yeah. <laughs> But um, so yeah, like sleep is a familial thing. You know, sleep exists in the context of the family. You know, kids learn the importance of sleep from their parents. They see their parents staying up late. They they see that as the value. Um, if they see parents who don't really set limits in bedtime and structure, they learn that that's sort of the value. When they see their parents falling asleep on the couch every time the TV is on, you know, when they see their parents who can't stay awake, but they see their parents who are constantly complaining about how sleepy and tired they are, they learn that that's, that's what they should be emulating. That's a sign of, of, of what they should be doing. And I think we need to be that's a little normal, aware. Normal of, to do that. Yeah. Right. That, that's what's normal. That's, that's what adults do. Um, and I think that's what we're modeling. You know, that's social learning. And I think that's, that's an important thing we tend to forget. Um, we also, we have this issue of schools. You know, we have a lot of schools that are starting way too early. Um, it, it's backwards where like the younger kids go to school later and the, early, the older kids go to school. It's totally backwards. Um, so I, it's, it's, we have these structural things set up. We have these family dynamics set up. And then we have issues of sleep problems in kids that often, again, don't get addressed. So I, I remember when I was in graduate school, Sleep apnea in kids was was a tonsils issue. Um, it was you know it was treated with with surgery. By the time I finished grad school, sleep apnea in kids was actually kind of also an obesity issue, even though it didn't used to be. Then by the time I was a postdoc, a lot of the kids who were coming into the, the pediatric clinic with sleep apnea were obese. Um, it was it was a change, um, and, and I don't know that I'm that old, but um, it was it was it was a change I saw. Like I was there, you know, I, I learned one thing and then had to change what I learned. I think that that all of these social, environmental, and structural issues, you know, kids are, are, are sort of at the bottom of that food chain. They do, they, they don't have all this control that we do. And so what, when you see sleep apnea in kids, it just especially when it doesn't have to do with some sort of uh, um, a, an anatomical issue that, that there was no control over, nothing anyone could do anything about. But when you see it as preventable, 
it just it's just heartbreaking to see because it's not their fault, and it was it was the system or 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 us you know or whoever who failed them, and and I think it's something we need to increasingly be aware of. Uh, Peter and Jamie are are you had said before that you uh, have been talking with your family a little bit of your family history in regards to bipolar. I think you said it was, and then um, now are you you had said that people are starting to look at getting sleep tests. Are they are they more of like your age group or your siblings, or is it coming down further, you know, into the family tree where? You know, I would say more than siblings are, my siblings are starting to wonder it, and certainly my my kids to some extent are starting to wonder it. You know, I will say, I guess going back to the other topic, that there's some hope because I clearly notice in in my kids, their attention to their baby's sleep habits is much more intensive than ours were. <laughs> you know, when we had our kids, so you know there seems to be a a a, a learning that's a, a um, uh, an education that is happening that is taking hold in that respect. Um, so I'll, I'll say that on that. In terms of my family, you know, that uh, there's also a lot of stubbornness in my family. So, you know, everybody uh, denying is uh, no doubt the power of denial, you know, um, denying that the sleep apnea might be a problem. But on the other hand, I know that they're all thinking about it, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's hard sometimes, as, as Jeannie said before, to, to encourage people to get a sleep study, even though. Yeah. That's so stubborn. <laughs> that's a whole psychological study in and of itself, Dr. Grander. <laughs> Why you can't convince your uh, bed partner to get a sleep study? <laughs> you know, I did. They did try to for a while, but I, I see it in clinic all the time. I mean, it's often I often see someone come in and say. I don't need to be here. I'm fine. The only reason I'm here is because my spouse says she's divorcing me if I don't come to see you. And then, and they're like, fine, what do you need me to do? And like, fine, I'll jump through whatever hoops and then leave me alone. And then what happens is I actually, I actually have a letter on hanging on my office wall. You know, when I'm allowed back in my office, I'm, I would show you, um, it was written by one of those patients who came in and said that, and by the time, you know, a few months later when we were done, he, all of history is like, I got to tell all my friends. They all have this. They all need to come in. Like, this will save my life. And, and he wrote, he ended up, you know, writing a letter. And, and, and I think that's what I see a lot. You know, we have this attitude that you can somehow will yourself out of it uh, or will yourself through it or will yourself through all of the symptoms. And, and like, we got to teach people. This isn't an issue. This isn't a personal failing. This isn't an issue of willpower. This isn't like pain you got to power through. This is like you can't you can't will yourself out of high blood pressure. Like you can't you 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 can't emotional fortitude yourself out of a high A one C, out of diabetes. Right? Like it is what it is. You either take response. You know the way I like to t t tell people about this is, you know, you got to take responsibility for yourself because nobody else is going to take responsibility for you. You got to take responsibility for your own health, whether it's your fault or not. At the end of the day, it's your responsibility. And usually, the people who don't like to come in also like to feel like they're responsible for themselves. Uh, and so, that's usually a good way to sort of twist their arm. But yeah, no, it's important. Um, the family is important. Getting the family involved, having the family be supportive, having sleep apnea be normal, like a thing that look, a lot of people have this. It's not shameful. It's not embarrassing. Like. You know, it's actually, it's more embarrassing if you're snoring super loud and stop breathing during the night and everyone else in the house wakes up and you're not doing anything about it. Like, that's what should be. Be embarrassed about that. Get a sleep test and get that dealt with. Um, and I think the more we, we, we put these images out there, um, the more of these humps will get over. Yeah, we, we often talk about that, um, you know, the first the first sleep study that you have is, uh, you know, with your bed partner that's given you the elbow <laughs> all night long because you keep waking them up. Uh, and, you know, we said this before, if you think about it, you know, not only does that person, you know, uh, probably have sleep apnea, but you are giving a disrupted sleep schedule to the other person that's in your bed. So now they're moody and irritable and unhappy and all of those things that we were talking about before um, because they're not getting a good night's sleep. So. Yeah.
Well, any, um, I think we're about ready to wrap up here. Any closing thoughts, um, Aaron, that maybe you want to have? And then we'll move to Peter and Jeannie and then finish up with uh, Dr. Grander. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Aaron, do you have any closing comments or advice to our community out there about um, you know, getting tested or, or getting a, uh, choosing a treatment option? I would just say that, um, you know, if you have any of these symptoms, really think about going in and getting tested and do it as early as you possibly can. Because I, you know, I had this for eight years before I went in and got tested. And I honestly believe that a lot of the reason I'm still suffering from some of these, you know, mental cognition problems is because, uh, you know, I went for eight years with, um, you know, chronic sleep deprivation and chronic oxygen deprivation. So, um, you know, please get tested early if you think there's any chance you may have it because it can really uh, change your quality of life to get tested and get treatment. Thanks, Aaron. Peter and Jeannie, any uh, closing thoughts from you guys? <laughs> I, I would say that after ha what happened to me, what I'm really advocating for and where I like to, to try to help the, the, uh, the association is is that you know clearly a lot of people have this and, and the barrier really is the cost and the complexity of the sleep studies and the insurance companies and so forth and you can just see how these interrelated problems you know it seems like almost everybody who has mental health issues should be tested but the cost and the complexity of doing that and um so i'm a real advocate for these uh, for technological development and the at home you know sleep studies something that make it simple and then access to CPAP machines and and uh, that it just should, they should be much less expensive and much more accessible given the nature of the problem. Oh, look, we have someone getting a sleep study on Thursday. Good for him. Good for Mark. Right. He's Excellent. <laughs> and Dr. Graner, we'll finish up uh, with you before I close out. Any, any closing thoughts for our community here? Sure. Um, I, I think it's important to remind people sleep studies don't hurt. They don't draw blood. There's no needles. You know, they don't shove a thing up your nose to get uh, a swab. <laughs> all, all you have to do is sleep, you know, it, it, and, and I've heard all the excuses as to why it's not worth getting or I'm not going to sleep enough and blah, blah, blah. Just do it. It doesn't hurt. Um, and you can only learn from it. So I would say that. And then, and then to circle back to the issue that, you know, if do it for your health, do it for your bed partner, do it for your brain. Uh, do it for your mental health. You know, take responsibility for what and do what you got to do to take care of yourself. Um, and we all, and, and I say we collectively as a sleep research field, as a sleep clinician with my other hat, uh, and then I'll, I'm sure I'm also speaking on behalf of the organization of the ASAA too. Like we're all in this together and we're all uh, willing to help each other out. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and that's why I'm so thankful to have all of you join us here today. Um, you know, us working together as a community, sharing our patient stories, bringing in the experts. Um, that's a way that we're just going to raise awareness and, and help people overcome some of those hurdles that they're facing and they don't know where to go. There is someone out there that's experiencing just about the same thing that you are. And so, you know, we are here, we have our various uh, social media channels on Facebook and Twitter and, uh, and uh, LinkedIn that, you know, you can reach out. Um, and so we're, we're here for you. That's what, that's what a patient community is all about. So I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. And just want to remind everybody that this is exactly the middle of sleep timber. It is September 15th. We got 15 more days to go. And so we, uh, we have uh, two more uh, Tuesdays in the month of September, and uh, we have two great upcoming shows uh, the next two weeks. So please join us, you know, back here next Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time, here to take your questions and, uh, and comments. And thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you all for, for sharing your stories and your expertise with, with us thank today. You. Thank you.